Hey folks and welcome to John and Leon's Elvis Reviews. This time we're taking you to Memphis, it's 1969 and it's at American Sound. And how are you doing today, Leon? You alright? Oh, fantastic, John. Absolutely brilliant. Looking forward to another, another cracking one. And, you know, this one is a belter. It is. It I've, is. Got to, I've got to admit. And, you know, I've been looking forward to doing this one for a little while and uh, we've had we've had a little shot of it before, um, but I thought... As you say, Leon, we we swayed away from, you know, the the tracks in hand basically, and uh, yeah. I think we'll we'll try and stick to a strict regime of like just song by song by song, and then give a little bit of a backstory to the sessions as well. Yeah, absolutely. The last time I waded up, going from sixty nine to seventy four to seventy seven and back to sixty nine, I think we've talked about anything but sixty nine for half of the time. So. <laughs> I know. I know. I, know. <laughs> I, I I think that's how we 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 both decided to to revisit the nineteen sixty nine yeah, stuff absolutely. and um, you know um, before these sessions you know Elvis had just finished um, the trouble with girls which uh, wrapped up in the December yeah and uh, you know he he couldn't have been in any better shape of his life at this point and you could tell that the uh, the sixty eight special has 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 given him that confidence to. To you know, respark his career as as it were, on the crest of a wave, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's very the word legendary is very much overused, but I think when it comes to these sessions, I think it's apt because it changed Elvis's direction. It it got him out of the malaise that he'd been in with the movie soundtracks. I know he'd started to move with the guitar man sessions and even as far back as sixty six with the How Great Thou Art sessions. Yeah, totally but, agree, yeah. But the, there were three or four elements within this these sessions that make them stand out unique. First of all, he's tackling far more mature material than he'd ever tackled before. Oh yeah, and the and the first song the first song we'll, we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, the, the 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 background to the I was say the background, but the story in that song is testament to that. And of course, you've also got the fact that it was actually guided and produced almost properly for virtually the only time in his entire career where. But, but, you, but you can tell, but you can tell that though, Leon, because Elvis didn't get that. Yeah, I mean, Elvis got that, you know end of you know product uh you know like he got the final say yes. of that product Ejected, produced, absolutely. yeah of course but you know there was a an actual producer that cared about the sound it cared about elvis you know and he wasn't a yes man to elvis in the slightest he was there to produce an artist and an artist elvis presley was yeah and uh, I think Elvis fed off of that big time because you can tell in this material, you know, that Elvis was on top for him and he was willing to work because at the end of the day, it is work. But he he enjoyed these sessions, but he didn't get that type of, I'm going to go into the studio, play gospel music for four hours and then cut some records. It was boom, 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 boom. Um, because... I've heard on your channel quite a lot of the first to the last uh, takes there, Leo, like the first take mm -hmm. to the master and stuff like that. And there's not a lot of messing about. No, there's no... Uh, uh, a chess is chips moment, of course, that we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, of course. And, and, th and this between... after From from after the, the singer uh, presents Elvis special in 68 until his final recording session in uh, the Jungle Room in 1976, this is the only session in between then where he wasn't produced by Felton Jarvis. And you can hear some of, some of the encouragement that Chip's moment is given, both to, not just to Elvis, but also to the way that the musicians are playing. Yeah. And Felton Jarvis never did that. It was left to Elvis to tell a certain musician that you need to do this or you need to do that. But Chip's moment was, was although Elvis was number one and essentially... Possibly you could stay still in still in charge. Chip's moment wasn't difficult to wasn't wasn't difficult. He wasn't afraid to butt heads with Elvis when it came to that. And you see the benefit of that because I think Elvis needed steered in that direction. Mm. You can have all the talent in the world, but if you've not got somebody who's steering that talent in the right direction, 
then it can go, it can just go haywire. Yeah. So it was co- really was controlled properly by Chips Moment. Well, I I find that as a, as being a singer and a musician myself, Leon. Right, I've, um, I could play in the house, right? But you've not got that person at the other side going, John. You 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 could maybe hit that note a little bit higher, or you you know they, they give you a little bit of direction. That's what a producer is supposed to be. Discipline. Not just discipline, not somebody just fiddling with knobs and stuff like that. that yeah, absolutely. Any, anybody could do that. It's all about getting that relationship with the artist or whoever, and not being able to, te- not being frightened to tell them, "Look, you've made a little bit of a mistake there." Yeah, sometimes rawness is good, but you need a little bit of p- a perfection in there because that's why it's a studio recording in the first place. And um, I've been to numerous studios. Um, to record and stuff and there was one guy who recorded me and he was just happy just for me and my friend just to record all day and I'm like, but we could do this anyway we wanted a little bit of strictness there Leon somebody to tell us when where we're going wrong and where we're going right because that lets you grow as a musician because you know the next time around or if you're even playing a live set you think wait a minute that's where I screwed up the last time let's just focus on that do you know what I mean you're dead right and I also think that I think because of that listening through all the outtakes and all the alternate takes from this session is something of an education but it's also far more interesting because what you get in this session and and as I say we're still talking about Chip's moment here what you get from Chip's moment is right Elvis we need another take or you can do it better yeah. With Felton Jarvis, he left that to Elvis to decide whether they needed another take or whether they'd messed it up. But Chip's moment himself says, right, Elvis, come on, you can do this better. You can do this, we'll have another take. And it was essentially, he was guiding Elvis. And yeah. I think, and, and, and there's absolutely no doubt when you look at the quality and, the amount, and how revered these sessions are, that Elvis definitely reaped the benefits of that. And if you and if you found as well, Leon, and within these sessions, there's a lot of Elvis saying, "We can get a pickup from here. We can get a pickup from here," because that's yeah. that's Elvis thinking, "Right, I could do that again. Absolutely. I can do that. I can do that again." And I think, do you know what? I didn't. Elvis didn't get that type of discipline. Um, he had a little bit from Steve Binder, a little bit on the comeback special. He Elvis yep. was guided that way because Steve Binder was that type of producer. Although it was for television, yeah, but he had that same kind of drive as uh, Chips did. Oh, absolutely! But we're talking. As you, you, you've already said it yourself. We're talking about two different mediums. Uh, yeah, because mm-hmm. because it's far. E- I think it's far easier to to be like that, and I think Elvis naturally would be far more receptive to that sort of direction from Steve Binder than he certainly would have been from Chip's moment. Because I think for Elvis, it would certainly have been a culture shock to have somebody behind the booth essentially telling Elvis, no, I'm sorry, but that's not good enough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know, I think that would have been a culture but Elvis, but, but Elvis was, you know, he was human and he was he was grounded and he, he, he appreciated even negative you know, feedback because that's the only way that he could grow as an artist, or even, or even as a person. I think there's, two, I think in, in in the prevailing years, I just think don't think there was enough of that in no. the studio, and I, and think, I, think, I think Elvis think... It essentially became a bit. This is why, especially the later stuff, and I've talked, especially talking about the jungle room sessions, that there was too an awful lot of self indulgence in what he was recording. Um, I don't but, think but you can just tell, but, you, but you can tell though Liam because it's all it's all relationship breakup stuff it is to, 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 I mean I, the only one it's really not is last farewell <laughs> yeah. even I, the I, last I, of stuff for, for the heart is <laughs> you're right it is it's, it's, it's very it. it's very you know I don't want to use this term depressing because sometimes songs are good if they've got a depressing kind of tone to them because it, it it's it's bringing emotion to the to the song or to the person who's listening blah blah blah, blah. but as you say leon it's self-indulgence there the other the other good thing we about, about, about mentioning the jungle room session i know i keep mentioning that one and i'm kind of bypassing everything else but there's also a, another reason for that because this is 1960 january february 1969 that we're on just now yeah so and it's in memphis and in yeah, 76, it's almost seven years exactly later, almost the same time of year, 
and again it's in Memphis. So, so but the, I think though, the Leon, contact between the two sessions. I want to know if you'd agree with me on this one. The sixty-nine sessions, right? Elvis was focus, focusing on his career and working for his career, but by nineteen seventy-six, Elvis wasn't working for his career. As you say, it was a, it was basically, let's sing a few songs, let's get it over and done with, because. It took him. It took Elvis almost a week to record one album, and that was never heard of prior to then. Yeah, even he, in he, even in seventy five, he recorded him on what two days, two three days. Yeah, well, even when he didn't, when when, when he didn't care for the material he was recording, like doing the soundtrack sessions, there was virtually never a time when he took a whole day to record one song, and that's all, and like when he had recorded Solitaire, that was the only song he recorded that day yeah. in seventy six. So. <clears throat> I think that that definitely shows the contrast between the two. And you're dead right. I don't think he was. I wouldn't say he was fighting for his career. I think the '68 special had kind of brought him back into that. But I and think I, I what, think I think because obviously Elvis had seen it in the December. Yeah. So that's given him the the confidence boost that's going to bring him into the '69 sessions, and that's going to and that's going to give him that right. Okay. Right. I'm not so worried now. This is this has catapulted me a little bit back into you know the top. So let's that's the TV done, right? And then let's get some hits. Let's get some hits at the back of this comeback special, which you know he you had memories. You've got if I can dream, etc. So that's yeah. already there. But I think that was in the spring of '69. Was that not yeah. released? Yeah. And then yeah. you had. In the ghetto, which we'll cover later on in the podcast. Yeah, and there's a suspicious mind in the August. So throughout that year, you know, yeah, it was hit after hit, and it was. And the first song we're going to review, Leon, is um, "Long Black Limousine," which is the first song that they do at the sessions. And and you know what, I th- I'd I'd have to say that "Long Black Limousine" is probably in my top three. It's an outstanding track. It, it, Absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, we've kind of got a trend here. Every time we do a session, it's it's not been by design. I don't think it's been, but we've almost we've always included the very first song we cut when we did stacks, and when we did from uh, when we did the Nashville sixty three sixty four session. We've we've always included the very first song. Well, of it's the letting session. listeners it's letting listeners hear how Elvis was when he first arrives. Uh, know that the feel of the session. How I mean, because you you want to. You want a bit of a story there, don't you? You want a bit of a a, be- a beginning, middle, and an end kind of thing going Absolutely. on. Absolutely, but I mentioned I mentioned that, and, and as I say, John, you obviously when we put this together, that it's not by design that we've no, done this. Defi- no, definitely not. We're we we're just folks. We're just picking songs that are you know that we truly Absolutely. love ourselves, and and it it just tends to fit because but, you'll find Leon with within yourself, right? The first song Elvis usually does at a sessions bloody phenomenal you've got like 20 days 20 nights 1970 yeah. yes you know you've got long black limousine you've yes. you know you've been named but a few elvis always gives that ultra best at the first song he tries at a session i don't know what it is he's maybe just trying to get himself comfortable you know and there's always a brilliant jam before any of this happens you know and uh but long black limousine and i've heard the 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 undubbed stuff and the wow. both they're both just as good. But he excuse me, hearing that guys on their own the, the Memphis boys like they're absolutely oh they're so so good and you can tell why they were used for so many different artists because they were very versatile. They could play anything, those guys. I think we I think we Long Black Limousine <coughs> sticks out as far as we're talking about first so, first song of recession is that Elvis attacks this song with a vigour that he'd never done before no. at the start of it. I think, because I think you can almost, as, as you, you mentioned it as you go through the takes, he's give, he's hitting, actually hitting this full, absolute full pelt, mm. right from right from the off, and it's it's it really does, and it really disappoints me that this song's not as well known as it should be, because I think everything's involved in this, and we, we, we've spoken a lot about the storytelling mode, and that's what he's in. He's, he's narrating in this song. I just think when when it was released in, in from Elvis in Memphis, it was it was released on the, on the fourth track of the first side of the the album, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it should have been side A, track one. 
Yes. Oh, absolutely. The way it was, I mean, the way it was, the way it was, the way it was released on the from Nashville to Memphis, the the sixties Masters set. That it was, it was in its correct place and exactly where it should have been. Yes, and you know what? It's funny because it's one of my most favourite discs of the set. I think di- disc three into disc four, because yeah. that's when that's when you feel the direction changing. Yes, absolutely. And, and it's Elvis in the nineties, and people think of Elvis in the nineties, but the projects that came out in the nineties, folks, was absolutely phenomenal. The, yeah. the sound quality was brilliant, you know, and they were working for the fans. They weren't working for themselves. They were working for us. Yeah, I to- absolutely, totally agree. Totally agree. And but do, do you know? Sorry, John, you go. No, and I, I just, I just find that you know, the long black limousine. There's a, a little pet peeve with it, and I think I've spoke to you about this before, off off air and stuff, Leona. Yeah. Take one so good and it stops halfway through the piano section yeah. there's a little there's a little bit of a piano I wouldn't say a solo it's just a little bit of a bridge you yeah. know the, the lead up to the next part of the song and uh, Chip stops it for some bizarre and I think Chips wasn't happy with the percussion yeah um, yeah. because the the cymbal right. wasn't getting hit hard enough or something like that and they had to re-mic stuff yes and and I thought Really, I, 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 and and I'm quite fussy with sound audio quality and stuff like that. And I thought it sounds good to me, but obviously I'm no producer, so he's heard something that's not he's not happy with. Plus, he's got headphones on. He's in that booth. Because and... even because even Elvis was a bit. Oh, all right, okay. Yeah, but that's proper that's proper production though. Oh, most definitely, and you know then then um, you know it goes into like. I think I can't remember if I think was take two a full take. I can't remember. Take um, two. Yeah, it was take now two a full because I've heard now, it time and time now, again. But now, you, now you're asking. I don't want to give false information on the podcast. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's where you come in. No, it was a long false start. Because it goes, yeah, because it, it goes into the uh, yeah, take, yeah. Take six was the first was the first full take. The first full take and yeah and i just I, the piano arrangement right i don't want to kid anybody until i did a wee glance at my wee side notes here to <laughs> of course you did i don't want anybody to think that that that, that, that was with the pause i tell there's one thing i don't like about the master take leon and it's the the clap with the piano yeah. it didn't need it it was too yeah. much yeah but that gets that gets overpowered by the the bells, yeah. You know the chimes uh, when yeah. it was overdubbed later on, um, but I think it was just a timekeeping method for Elvis's sake. And uh, but at the the I, if the first I think I think Leon, see if the first take was completed, yeah, that could have almost been a master. It's just phenomenal, and it, it's yeah. it's got it's got a bit of a boogie woogie kind of thing going on there with the piano. Is it, yeah, okay, it sounds a bit busy, right? I get that, but it's not uh, because let's face it, this song's about death. Well, and, do you know, um, I was I was just going to mention that there, and I was just going to say that if if you take you mentioned twenty days and twenty nights before beforehand, John, from yeah. from from his next, from the next recording session in in, in Nashville in nineteen seventy, yeah. which was more mature material. Mm-hmm. But this is but this is the first time, virtually the first time, where Elvis has actually openly almost explored death itself. Now we mentioned when, when we did the 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 sixty three sixty four Nashville session, we covered uh, along Long Lonely Highway. Where we th- we think that there's a a veiled reference to suicide suicide in that. But so there was in uh, anything that's part of you. Do you think so, really? Yeah, yeah, of course, because uh, um, <laughs> I'm running through it in my head now. <laughs> but there's no reason left for me to live. Yeah, but is that is that not just a euphemism? Is that not just a way that it people could, it, people talk? It's... It could well be, but you know. <sighs> The more I listen to it, and I, I, I don't know because. But then again, that's what nineteen sixty one, sixty two. Yeah. You know, 
death itself wasn't really used in songs apart from like what what you're talking about there where it's, it's a long lonely highway yeah i thought that was a bit more o- that it was a bit more obvious even if it is still a bit pretty much veiled yeah. but but of course with long black limousine there's absolutely no doubt because but but what that's, I like what, it, that's about, what it's written about but what's so good about it is that and almost in the same way, there's a twist in Memphis, Tennessee from that same one. You don't yeah. actually understand this a funeral cortege until halfway through the song. That's right. And I think that's really, really good. And Elvis manages he manages to, to, to tell that story really, really, really well, like he does. And it's, it has that gospel feel to it as well. Well, that's it, Leon, because when I let non-Elvis fans hear this song, right? They'll hear this chimes at the start, and they're a bit like, "Oh, that's dark." And that goes, "Give it time, give it time." And then, as you say, when they when they when they notice it's about a funeral corsage and stuff like that, they go, "Oh, that's oh, that's what it's about." I'm like, "There's a there's a, like a spin on the song there, isn't there?" You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a wee bit of trivia for you. So there was thirty two so th- thirty two songs Elvis recorded during these Memphis sessions, right? Now. Of that, of those thirty-two, there are three definite, definite references to death in those songs, yeah. and what and a possible fourth. Now, in the ghetto, and Mama liked the roses. That that those are absolute definites, and of course, long black limousine. Now, don't cry, Daddy. Could either be the death of death of the mother in that, or a divorce, or a breakup. So yeah. there is a possible it could be one of those. However, however you inter- interpret it. But the point is, that shows the, the mature direction that Elvis had gone. And I know I keep mentioning it, but it's really important because it shows that Elvis has grown as an entertainer as well as co- after the comeback. I know I know that we've kind of slated Who Am I, right? Which, yeah. you know, we'll get, we might, we might follow another time. Yeah. But that's someone asking themselves what they are as a human being. It is, but it's. I think. I think the problem. That's why I like that song. But yeah, okay, the production was not the greatest, right? But I like the lyrics, and you know, and maybe it was something that Elvis was feeling at the Pacific time when he wanted to do it. I don't know. Do you know, um, John? I, I think the biggest problem with Who Am I isn't the song. I think it's the fact that it's essentially a, almost a, a kind of gospel type song from a, from a session where. There was nothing else in, in that. Had that been recorded, and they had touched, he touched me sessions. Then yes. nobody, I think, they would have been batted an eyelid. I think it's content. Do you know? Do you know? If I, I find, I find, and I, I don't know if you, you agree with me, Leon, on this one. It sounds as almost like it belongs to the change of habit stuff. Um, what do you think? I think it would have belonged there that sessions rather than the. The, the, the famous 69 stuff because Change of Habit folks was 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 recorded in the, was it the March of 69? Well, it was but I'm, I'm going to disagree with you slightly a wee bit here John and which, which doesn't happen very often yeah. but but the only way I'm going to see and I, 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 I get don't get me wrong I get where you're coming from on that but the only thing I think of it is the, the, the Change of Habit the songs for Change of Habit were all kind of beat and who am I is not I think that's where it might not fit in and I think that's why um, Let's Be Friends wasn't included in the film because that was a bit downbeat as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, but, sorry, And yeah, well, going back to Long Black Limousine here, yeah, and, yeah, you, know, um, you know, the, the the band is so tight on this one. Oh, and wow. and uh, I don't know, like, see when you hear the undubbed stuff and then you, then you, then you hear the master. Yeah. And you hear the backup singers, and yes, they give that ingredient to the song, and it, it, it gives it that overall sound. But I don't think it was necessarily needed. Not really. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I, it's good because you remember when you said Leon the last time, where you know the six to nine stuff was built layer by layer by layer, yes. right? Yes. And you know, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I find I find them. Um, Brilliant backing singers, by the way. The, the fact we're not getting slated for this, but <laughs> I prefer I prefer them to the sweets. I always have done. The the holidays and yeah, yeah. I, just, I think I think they've just got better voices. You know, overall. I mean, 
I'm not saying that they were bad, uh, the Sweet Inspirations. But I'm they have that, it. they have that sh- sh- sort of same sort of sound as the Sweets. Yeah, I just, because I find like, you know, um, do you know what, I'm going to bring it up when I when we talk about the end of Ghetto because I could use it as a reference point to that. Yes. But I just find, you know, I, it could be just because, you know, they, they suited better being a studio uh backups of singers, you know, that the holidays and stuff like that. I don't know. And but I just find I find them a bit overpowering and on We're Not Loved On Look as well. I was like, oh, I was like just quiet a little bit. Well the backing vocals and, and the, I think the backing vocals throughout this whole session that were just wonderful. But were they good because they were they were overdubbed and they weren't done at the same time? Is that is is that does that help? Maybe. Maybe and you know I think with backup singers, you need to have that feel with the artist you're singing along with. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean, Leon? Yeah, and I, yeah. I think, and, I, and sometimes you find that with Elvis in the 71 sessions because they are actually there with him. Mm-hmm. And they could feed off each other a little bit more. Do you know what I mean? But that's me just being fussy, though. That's me just being <laughs> me. I mean, I else, be. Well, it's just I'm allowed to be, yeah, exactly, yeah. because we're all different. So. Let me ask you, we'll go back to the Long Black Limousine again. Let, let, me, let me ask you, I've written that I think, and I don't know if you agree with me, but I think that in the hands of a lesser singer, I think this really could have become a depressing dirge. But I think he makes, because of because of how much, and I, I know I keep mentioning it because I really feel it's true. Have you much, heard Charlie Rich's version? I have. Mm. And I love Charlie Rich because he's one of my top singers. I love him. But... It's awful. I really just didn't think he suited that song in the slightest. Yeah, I think you have to. I think well, there's a few things, the elements that that, that I feel in maybe this, that I think about. So first of all, I've said as I keep saying about the fact, the fact he's a master storyteller and interpreter. I think that makes it a riveting listen. But I also think that that it, it, it puts and I mentioned this to me back at the, the start that it puts every end of energy into the song. But I also feel that he managed to blend the aspects of country and soul together. Of course, yes, in this one, and oh yeah, but that's why Elvis was the king because of the fact he could mould different types of music and put it into the one track. Yeah, and it takes a lot of effort, and it takes a specific band as well to do that. Yeah, I, I, I agree totally. Now you mentioned a way back before then about about um, we mentioned that take six was yeah, yeah. well that was the only complete take apart from the master that was actually uh, that was actually done but it, it, it a lot of people don't maybe not realize this but elvis was obviously or chips moment one of them was unhappy with his vocal and he went back and re- re-recorded it but but strangely he didn't re-record at all he only re-recorded no, exactly. from yeah. through, through tearful dies until the ending and that was in the early hours of the 22nd of january because so, I know, like I know, like your favourite word sometimes <laughs> is bombastic, right? Yes. And take six is at the end. It was a bit okay. Yeah. So I think they realised maybe Elvis himself. I don't know. Thinking okay, I'm going a bit. I'm getting too much into it, like Elvis did on Sound of Your Cry or whatever. Yeah. And the, the yeah, I don't think it would have been. It would have been a great song, but I don't think it would have given that nice ending it should have had which would do, which we have in a master now and what yeah. what song do you think what what i don't know what what uh take are we going to choose for this uh, 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 i think it has to be the master because there's not an awful lot to choose but see before we play john can i just add you one more one more thing about that actually because it's just something that's popped into my head there what do you think of the mix on the the memphis record of the Hate song it. <laughs> it's horrible isn't it in fact, that, the only song I like on the Memphis record would have yeah. to be We're Not Loved On Look because you've got that mix of left and right drums. That, that's the yeah. only thing that... I, that what, what what were they doing? It's a very... It, it's a very strange album. It's a, it's a, stra- it's a strange uh, choice of songs. Yes. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't flow. And... Um, the drums and bass are way too high, um, the, the the string sections or the orchestrated stuff, that's way, way far away somewhere. Yes. Elvis' voice has been altered a lot. Um, sorry if I'm not selling this. 
no, 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 no. I'm actually, I, I, I knew you were going to, I, I've set you up a wee bit, because I knew fine what you were going to say on this. I, I, because, <laughs> because actually you're echoing exactly my own thoughts, to be honest. Well, and believe it or not, I own a copy of it, and I, and I paid, as do I. Hefty, I paid a hefty price for it, because it's not really out there as such. No, I don't think, I don't think, I think, I don't think it's, I don't think it's in print. It, no, definitely not, and, and, uh, it's easier to get on CD, but it's quite more difficult to get on LP because it was '87 it came out. It was, and that was when Elvis releases weren't the greatest. Right, let's yeah. face it. Let's face yeah. it, mate. Right, the '80s wasn't a good time for Elvis stuff. Yeah, I mean, okay, I think the '80s stuff was better for VHS and. Get a, a get a visual at Elvis, right? As you said yeah. in the last time, when your dad getting that's where it yeah. is and blah 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 blah. But for you know re releases was well the last time you got a good re release was nineteen eighty the RCN International stuff, right? Yeah. But even that alone was pretty poor. Yeah. Because if you heard the sound quality of the RCN International stuff, ooh. <laughs> Elvis for everyone, what happened? <laughs> Oh God! And um, but um, I think that was the last straw for you know that they ruined good material. They yeah, ruined absolutely. a good. They, I mean, yeah. But then again, as we talk about Elvis in the nineties, and that became a thing. Yeah. It was, I think, you know, the, some awesome stuff there. You know, they did. They did. They did. Like they like did. the sixties masters there. And well, pff. actually, the 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 the, 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 the third full CD that I ever got. Um, was actually back in Memphis, and um, when that's when Elvis, I'm um, almost Elvis in, in the '90s stuff, and I, I just played that, I just played that to death because I, I was able to hear like the, the intro to a little bit of Green, that piano intro, just like it never, and it was actually now I, I, I actually had the the double L, vinyl LP which I'd listened to to death. But do you know what? It was only when I got that CD that I could actually hear the counting at the start of Inherit the Wind. Yeah. Inherit the Wind, and it was only on that CD that I was able to hear that. I'd never heard that before. And I'm going, what is that in the background? <laughs> Thank God somebody else could hear that <laughs> because it, it's it's um yeah yeah and and you know my dad had that CD in the nineties. In fact, yeah. he had the oh god, I think. Well, we got it in '97. Yeah. Now, it's funny. My dad was an odd, odd fan. Right, he had <laughs> he had them all on sixties masters, but he still got the other stuff. You know, I'm like that as well. Yeah. And do you know that's very expensive now? Is it really yeah, the Elvis back in Memphis CD is because it's not in print anymore. Wow. And it's not been in print since the nineties. Can do you, you believe get, that? Do you want to get two copies of that as well? Well, there you go. It's the same with the. the <laughs> The Raised on Rock album, but oh, that's not. Oh, but that's not, in, that's not in print either. Uh, I neither is. Um, he touched me. Goodness me. Um, yeah, they're all the the close the early well, the latest press you can get is the nineties. Wow. Well, um, well. and I don't know why they did that, Leon. You know they don't think it, from Elvis in Memphis is still in print because I've got that one. Yeah. But for if you if you're wanting Elvis back in Memphis on CD, you're looking at about thirty quid. Wow, well, because uh, I, ca I came across it because actually I was looking at tapes yesterday to collect yeah, some tapes. Yeah, you that to me. And I'm thinking, holy moly, like the price of tapes. Yeah, absolutely. <sighs> I couldn't believe it, but I mean, I remember spending a bit more of like, but but yeah, I think we should play um, the master. I, I, I of... think so, John. But what I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to say this just just before we play, it, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this before we play every one of these songs that we're going to play. <laughs> if, if if you want to hear. It from first take to the from the first take through to the master. Yeah. Then go to my channel, click on just type in Long Black Limousine on my channel, and you'll be able to hear it from everything we've been talking about with this song, right from the first take right through until the master, and you'll see and you'll also hear Chip's moment in the background actually giving Elvis all that sort of guidance that we've yeah. been talking about. And then before we play every one of these songs, uh, I'm going to remind you about that that you can go and you can listen to that there um, as well as hearing the master here. 
Yeah, because it, it just it just saves our channel from getting into any bother, and you know we want to stay here as long as we can for you guys. Absolutely. And if that avoids that, and you're still getting to hear the songs that we're we're talking about. Yeah. and we're just going to reference them and, and then just direct you to the, the right ones and do you know if you want to listen to other takes and listen to other you know it's introducing you to the session not just songs and you could you know list them as your leisure rather than having to go through our conversation well, to get, and, to, get to that specific song you could just play it and then come back to it you know absolutely and as i mentioned it, uh, uh, earlier on that what you will find is that there's a lot less repetitiveness in the Memphis 69 sessions than you might find in maybe, for example, the Elvis Today sessions or the Jungle Room sessions where essentially Elvis just wanted to get the tracks cut and wanted it when done and get away home again. Um, although in Jungle Room sessions he was already was home, but you, you get what I mean. But here he really is working properly and you'll find in a lot of these takes that the first take quite often doesn't really have the sound, sound the same as the, as the master. No, definitely not. And, you know, I have to admit, I'm really, really impressed with the Elvis at American, 1969. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, that the was the sound... in the blanks, essentially. Yeah, and oh, what an impossible bloody box set to get hold of. <laughs> it's really expensive. It's on yes. Spotify. And it's on YouTube. You can get the, yes. you know, you get the actual official releases there. But you've also filled in the blanks that FTD didn't as well, though, Leon. Yeah, because there's FTD for for whatever reason. So FTD, if I say, by the way, that FTD of course stands for Fall That Dream, which is um, RCA Sony's Elvis Collectors label, and. With the, with, the, with the set that you're talking about, John, it, it's supposed to complement... Well, the price every, level, you mean? <laughs> oh, goodness me, that that's the way they've gone now. Uh, don't get me started on Don't get me started on that now. Um, so essentially what they've done with this is the, everything that they hadn't that they thought they hadn't covered before, they've tried to cover cover on cover on this. Yeah. But there are countless and a really good bootlegs and uh, bootlegs uh, se- session uh, sets from... American sound. Some are more complete than others. There's a couple yeah. that are really are complete, but you have to be careful which one you look at. Um, the American Sound Project is probably the best one, as far as consistency over sounds concerned. Right. And I've used a lot of that in in the in my first from first take to the master. Although where possible, I've always tried to use the for that dream stuff because the sound is maybe just a wee bit better. Um, yeah. Although not in all, not in all. Which is which is a bit of an indictment, to be honest. That, that it's not always that way. Sometimes the unofficial stuff's actually better sounding. If if you want to go and buy um, this set, if you're not interested in stories, and uh, not interested in a uh, a build up to a, a master, it's not you. It's that it's not what you're after. Correct. Because the Elvis at sixty nine, you're probably getting about one CD of specifically just one song. Yeah, and it's just the build up to the master it's Elvis trying to achieve the master so if that's not your cup of tea I would try and avoid it um, but you know I'm not saying it's all bad I'm not, I'm not saying it in that way but if you don't like hearing the same song for about an hour and a bit uh, I would avoid it maybe just list a few takes but that's what we that's what we're here for is to dissect the song for you and we pick the track that we think you should listen to and if you want to go listen to other stuff, it's there for you, really. So that's that's my <laughs> opinion on it, because it is it is a long, long box set, Leon, isn't it? it for is. just that specific it few is. songs, isn't it? it really, is. it is. For us, it's so, heaven, though. Well, yeah, because we are, you know, Elvis fans, and you know, I, I I hope to God that you know there's somebody out there going, I only like just the box standard songs and if this introduces another fan to Elvis I'm really happy about that yeah, absolutely cause, job done because that's our job to bring you Elvis's legacy to a medium that's not, just not just not I the reaction videos really don't do nothing for me because you're hearing it from yeah you're hearing it from somebody that doesn't know Elvis stuff right but we do and we might not be 100% correct all of the time you know, but that's what me and Leon are here for because we bounce off each other, and uh, you know, it's 
you know we're going off track again but I, I just I just find that we're here just to give you the Elvis story and try and stay true to it as much as we can really absolutely you really expect everybody to agree with their point of view no that's what that's what the comments are there for as long as they're respectful to us and to Elvis himself absolutely correct we'll, we, we'll gladly take it because what's the point in doing this type of format if we're going to be scared of people's uh, opinions because we're, we're posting it on the World Wide Web here. So yeah. you're going to get someone that's going to go, mm, I'm not really happy. And to, but, but to be fair, Leon, my channel's not had that much poor comments. Neither is yours. In fact, mm-hmm. we get a lot of positive co- uh, feedback. You know, yeah. you get the odd maybe, you know, uh, I wouldn't say it's negative, but it's just somebody else's opinion on that session. It's not, it's not, they're not disagreeing with us. It's just that they've got their own opinion on what that song Which is or whatever. Which they're perfectly entitled to. Exactly, and uh, so yeah, that's the song we're going to direct you just now is the master take of Long Black Limousine. So the song you would have been directed to, folks, was Long Black Limousine, the master take, and the next song we're going to review from the session is A Little Bit of Green. Fantastic ballad, isn't it? Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. It gets a bit bombastic towards the end of the final chorus on it, but I just I love I love that piano intro. Oh, see that. See, that, oh, oh, what did you I think? Mean, what did you think of the rehearsal take? It's it's different. It's it's, it's like that's waltzy, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Hmm. Yeah. It is. And, and then and then it goes into that actual take one, and I thought, oh, I like that. <laughs> I like that because remember when Elvis says triplets? Remember? Yeah. Yeah. Now, and but it's a bit of a flourish with the piano key yeah. and uh, I thought oh could you have not just kept that in the master <laughs> but there's not much difference between that and the master is there really not not no, much not, at all no there's not really no there's not there isn't there isn't there is only there is only the two full takes you had that kind of rehearsal one yeah and then you had the actual master the, the actual master itself so there's not really a lot um, there's only three takes there's only three takes in the rehearsal as well so it's it's um, coming from a musician's point of view right the chord sequence is really strange the, right um, it's yeah I'm not it's, it's as I'm saying Elvis's music starting to delve into not your box standard standard sound if you know what I mean standard melodies yeah. he's delving into more complex stuff that's going to be quite difficult for him to achieve yeah which you can find in the sessions but as I said before he's got the confidence there to do it yeah and he's 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 singing melodies that I don't think he would have been able to do maybe about say nine years prior yeah yeah absolutely the vocals his vocals changed it plus he became more experienced as well and he's oh, become of course yes yeah absolutely and he's learning he's been learning through the years I mean if you listen to uh, as for example, is it so strange? Yeah. He really struggles with that. He really does struggle with that. And if you let, and but, I, if you but listen... Leon, that was written by Farron Young, right? And yeah. I'm a, and I'm a big fan of Farron Young and oh, underrated singer, by the way. And yeah. um, Farron Young's vocal range was quite high, a bit like Orbison. Yeah. So it was. Ri- he's probably written that in the mindset of him, of himself. But Elvis in '57 was quite a sort of baritone thing you know he was he had that deep but he, he could write high notes but not to the level he would have maybe done in say 61 62 3 yeah. 4 and then all the way back up again to say 69 yeah so i th- i think i think i think it would i think it would certainly have um had that been had that been uh, in 69 i think i think you would have got it certainly got it another, a lot better and it's another good storytelling song again once you, again well it, well it is and it, it, Elvis was, I think, it's his favourite guys. There is, is the protagonist lamenting a, a love, and I, I've written it as being a love unreciprocated, or in this case, a love lost. Yeah. And it, it's that I think. See, I, I've heard it described, and I kind of agree that Elvis. This is what this is what Elvis was so good at. I think a little bit of green is probably average material, but Elvis elevates it. And makes it did so- that quite a lot with oh, absolutely. songs that weren't really throwaway songs. Yeah, and I've got Elvis to be honest, could bring it to another level. 
Oh, yeah, I've got to be honest. I, I, yeah, right, you're right, John. And I've got to be honest, I have written that I think in lesser hands than Elvis and Chips moment, and this is this is the wording that I've used about this, I think it could have been over-sentimental schmaltz, and I really think that but it this could song, have been... But this song had a lot of revisits, though. Sorry, John, the, see that song, again This song had a lot of revisits to get to the master take, as in production-wise and mixing. Yes, oh, absolutely, yeah, it, it did. It definitely did. It did. And then you've got... What you also have is you have that nice harmony with Elvis and Charlie Hodge as well. And you know what? You know, to people who like Charlie Hodge, great guy, great personality, but sometimes his harmony was a bit much for me. But it goes with this song. It works. It works. It does. Yeah, it does. A bit like I'll Be Home Again. It works because it, it, it goes... Because two people... Like, let's, let's say, for instance, Leon, me and you are singing a song, right? It's yeah. got to work for both parties, not just one. Not just for Elvis Presley. It has to work for, say, Charlie Hodge as well yeah. as a singer. And if those two match and it fit together, it's a brilliant song. Yeah. Um, but some of the songs that Charlie harmonised on, especially live, was Ooh. terrible, right? Look at the mix for Fairy Tale from Omaha. Please, don't, mix. please don't go there. <laughs> please don't. But I think, I think that's more to do with the mix than, than anything else. I don't think... I think that's... Because... It's it not that Charlie could sing. It just sounds too overpowering. That's what I'm saying. And the mixing's too loud. Yeah. And... Um, you know, and it, it was not a, not till a little while ago that I didn't realise that Elvis went back into the studio in the September and re-recorded the the vocal. Well, what yeah, well, what I would say that that re-recording on the twenty sixth of September, nineteen sixty nine. If you go and listen to the first take to the master, then you you, you can understand why, because oh. Elvis's original vocal. It's really not. It really doesn't. It's not good enough. It's really isn't good enough. Now, I think that first January se- that first January sessions, I think there maybe had something had something else in a cold or an, there was an underlying problem because his voice wasn't perfect there. So you can understand why an awful lot of that stuff was re-recorded. And if you listen to the to the the, the first take to the master on that, it's perfectly understandable because the vocal the El- the original Elvis vocal. And a little bit again is almost completely different to the final vocal that he but, lays down. But would you go all the way to Nashville to do one track? Well, was that was that in Elvis's mind to do that or someone else's? Ah, uh, well, uh, well, I think I think if Elvis had heard that, I think Elvis would certainly have really say that I don't think I want that released like that because it really it it, it doesn't the original one doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound good at all. Um, I like the percussion in that song as well. It's got that. Oh, it's lovely. Oh, it's, it's nice. It's it's it's, oh, it's got a kind of military kind of uh, drum roll on the hi hat, and not the hi hat, really. Yeah, the hi hat. Sorry, and you know it's uh, and it's got you know, and I thought, oh, it's so so good. So so good, and it, it it's just a basic rhythm section as well. It's just acoustic guitar, piano, and yeah, bass. No, there was apart from apart from Charlie Hodges recording his harmony vocal um, when it was recorded his vocal. There were no further overdubs were added to no, it. No, because that's because that, as you say, Leon, it makes a good producer and a good engineer who was mixing it, it at the time. And do you know it's that's what that's just and. Oh, the the product was so good, and you know what? I I, I prefer back in Memphis album to the first one, and we've said by, this before. And, and I think by a million miles because it flows better. I think the material is much better too. I'm sorry to say. Yeah, I, I think I think had back in Memphis been released before from Elvis in Memphis, I think you would have got the same reaction. That back in Memphis would have been the would have been there. I think from, because from Elvis in Memphis was the first one released, and all that publicity, and of course you did, you did the front cover from the '68 special, and Elvis was on the back of the '68 special. I think, but 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 let's not let's let's not kid ourselves here. Some of the critical responses in '69 to from Elvis in Memphis were scathing. Yeah. Now now in 2020 now it's revealed. And quite rightly, Sits is one of the best albums ever recorded. 
Um, and I, I, I kind of see from Elvis Mason back in Memphis almost as the same thing. Um, I, I find it difficult to separate the two of them. I think if they're all, I see them all as one album. I know that's not the rate it should, but that's how I look at see, it. The way I see it, Leon, I don't see it as from Elvis in Memphis and back in Memphis. I, if I want to visit the sixties and stuff, I'll go to the sixties masters. Yeah, absolutely. To, to listen to it as a story, because I even know the track listing from one to twenty-three on the on exactly. the fourth disc and yeah. whatever. But the tracks, the standout tracks to me would be definitely. Um, the back in Memphis to the, to maybe obviously you've got like the long black limousine okay yeah. and another Gentleman song that's Mike. just wait to say that and <laughs> which we're going to do in a minute too <laughs> which I can't wait to get into my teeth of that one because yes. I've been I've been listening to the undub version oh, of that love. for ages yeah. so um. I think we've covered this song. I think. I think we've you know. Sort of... Well, just one more thing I would say. Uh, one thing I would say, and I'm going to. I'm, it's almost a contradiction what I'm going to say here. Now, the song would never be hit material, John. But do, do we agree on that? I beg your pardon. A, 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 a little bit of green would never. It's not. It's not. The song. The material is not strong enough to be hit material. No, I think it's an. It's, it, let's face it. It's an album track, but yes, a good album track. It is. It's a nice track. And much like the album from which it originates, back in Memphis, I think it really deserves to be better known outside the Elvis community. Now, it's very strange saying that when I've also said that it's not hit material, but I still really think that it really deserves to be better known outside the Elvis community. I really does. That's how I feel about that song. It, but it, it deserves it. it is. But of course, I'm a little bit biased that way because it, it really is one of my favourites. So I'm a little bit biased that way on that. See, I find with a little bit of green. Uh, I always, when I was kid, I was brought up in my dad's favourite stuff because basically I, had, <laughs> I had no choice in the matter. So it was um, one of his favourites. So I, I was, I, I listened to what he listened to, and and um, I thought as I got older, I thought no, I'm going to have my own opinion on Elvis stuff, and I'm going to listen to it the way I want to listen to him and stuff. Um, because let's face it, it, it was my dad's, it was my dad's collection, so he put it on whenever he wanted. And he picked the songs that he liked. So I was just listening to what he was listening to, probably like yourself, Leon. Yeah. And um, and like I said, my dad got the, the 60s Masters in 93. And it was always disc three and disc four, disc five even, that my dad was swaying to. And that's what I was listening to. And and I, I see, I do love Elvis as a ballad singer, I have to admit. I just, and as a storyteller as well, I love it. I love it, I love it, I love it. And I I don't know, what take would you like to choose for this one, Leon? Master, take one? Yeah, Master, or the Master, because... The Master because of the vocal repair. That That's why I would play the Master, because of the vocal repair. What you could do, Leon, you could put the link up to the to the one that, you know, was recorded then in the yeah. studio, and then it, one of the Master, and you could hear that difference between the two. Yeah, I would, this, is, this is definitely a song that I would definitely encourage, as I've said before, I'm going to say this before, before, before every song, that I would definitely go encourage you to go and look at From First Take to the Master, because then you'll hear, how the, the, you'll hear the song build, but you'll also hear what exactly what we're talking about, about Elvis's vocal not being as it should, and there's obviously an underlying problem, maybe Elvis' throat or whatever, during that, Janu- during that, Jan- that day in January, um, when we did the original, the original vocal on that. Yeah, I have heard it once before. The one that was obviously not done, and yeah, he struggles. He struggles yeah. a fair bit. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so yeah, I think we'll go with we'll go with like you know the undubbed, and then we'll go for the master, and we'll put it in the yeah. description, folks. Right? Absolutely. So, and I, I don't have to introduce them anymore because you can just go to it yourself. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so um, yeah, on to the next track. So next track then we're going to review from the sessions is going to be Gentle On My Mind. Um, been covered by many uh, yes. and I'm trying not to be biased here but I think Elvis done a brilliant version of this and it was different to what other countries, because let's face it it's a country song okay, um, but I think Elvis gives it a different flavour, what do you think? Yeah I, I, I totally agree John and when I when I talk about Elvis's version of Gentle in My Mind, I, I, I use two versions, uh, two different other singers' versions as reference points to Elvis's. Mm-hmm. So I use uh, Glenn Campbell's, which is almost complete, 
country. Yep. And then, and Elvis then takes it and makes it far takes it more and far more seriously than Glenn Campbell does. But I then also I also send people to what essentially Dean Martin's version, which is that kind of and I've got to use this is it blandification. <laughs> if that makes any sense. See, I'm a big Dean Martin fan, right? All of a sudden, oh, I love Dean. I love Dean. Don't my get da- me wrong. And my dad is, but gel on my mind just didn't suit Dino in the slightest. I don't but think do I you, just don't think it matched his sort of persona. Well, I tell you, I, see, see, and I know we're talking about Elvis, but when I talk about Dean Martin, I don't like his his studio version, but there is a great version where he, he, he introduces his television show with it. And he's got roses, and he's like trying to balance yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, and I think that I really, I really do like that one because I can picture that in my in my head when he's when he's doing that. <laughs> so I yeah. do like that version, and that's when he's got a cigarette in hand when he comes down and all that sort of thing. And I, I like I like that version. I do. I think. But, uh, but I think as well, folks. Um, I think you should go and listen to. But we we mentioned far and young. Well, I did briefly there in the last yeah. the, when we were talking about uh, is it so strange? Far and young's version of gentle on my mind is really really good. Um, it's it's a bit like hmm, it's a bit like Glenn's, but but a bit better. And and made in this in fact, all these guys recorded this in the same, same year, sixty nine. Yeah. Um, I think Glenn was 68, I think. I think it was the year before. But I think what we've got to say is that, remember that Glenn Campbell's version was a Grammy winner, so, you know, we've got to to be fair about that. You've got to give him credit where it's due. Absolutely. But of course, as I say, it's pure country. But Elvis adds Elvis a soul and God and I don't God think I don't think vocals. I don't think Elvis was set out to make this a hit. He just wanted it just to to cover it. And you can find well, that in a lot of Elvis absolutely. songs, don't you? But I think it could. I think it had had Glenn Campbell not recently won a Grammy for it. I think that could have been a, a hit for Elvis. Most definitely. And and you know, um, I was listening to the undubbed stuff of this yeah. song. Yeah. Oh, the harmonica. Oh, it's, oh, it's wonderful. And that bass line, that bass line is so prominent. Oh, that, oh. but I tell you what, if, 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 we'll go back to Glenn, uh, we'll go back to Dean Martin's again. You've got that do 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 all the all, all the way that's a brass through it. Whereas yeah. Elvis's Elvis's version, you've got that. It's almost like a, do you know, like a synthesizer. Well, it's going like dong 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 yeah, dong. Yeah, and, brilliant. And do you know, it's, 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 I think it's a saxophone in it. In it as well, that almost sounds like a like a vocal. It almost sounds like yeah. do you know the one and that I've, I'm talking I've all, about? And if all of us want to know what that instrument is, I think it's actually a muted key on the the keyboard. That's what is it that is. What it, is that, is that yeah. what it is? I, I have done my homework. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there yeah. speaks the musician <laughs> because it's a muted key, and you'll find that um, in the mid sixties, right where. And you've you all you always found it on a demo record. If somebody was wanting to maybe have a trumpet, or they would use muted keys on a keyboard to give it that sort of false trumpet sound. So that's the bit that goes ah uh, ah uh, uh, uh. that that's sort of, and I'm not I'm not a singer, but you get you get the bit that I'm talking get, about. That, yes, that, yes, yeah. And you'll if you listen to the undubbed version, you'll hear that instrument a lot more prominent because it's. I think basically, Leon, I think that instrument was a uh, was used as a guide. To Elvis and the band, it wasn't really there to be a prominent kind of thing, but yeah. if you, but it needs it, and if you don't hear it, you're like, you can't unhear it. You need to hear it because it's yeah. uh, it's a key ingredient. But I don't think it was essentially used for that, yeah. um, because I think I think the lead instrument in this song has to be the bass and the harmonica. Oh, it's it's, it's oh, fabulous. Musicianship it, is just. Second to none. It is, and it, 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 the, the arrangement was done by Mike Leach and Glenn Spreen, who were heavily involved in also in in well, Glenn Spreen especially in the arrangements for that's the way for that's the way it is. Yeah. And that, so so it's no surprise that, that there's a, a similarity in the way that that's done then. But you've also got Elvis. Elvis also added a harmony vocal onto it as well. Yes, exactly, and you know what? It 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 suits it. It definitely suits it. Yeah, because like a little bit of green before, 
LBC vocals were completely removed from the track from unexplained, we don't know why, and he re-recorded them, not like he went back to, like a little bit of green went back in, what did we say, it was in the September we said, what didn't we? It went back to that's, that's right, that's yeah. right, yeah. Where was, whereas Elvis re-recorded the vocals to this five days later on the 20th of January. So yeah. it's, it, I think it might just be a case of Elvis was not was unhappy. And the, the, the travesty to me is because I absolutely love that. I mean, I absolutely adore this song and I, the Elvis verse of this and I can play it constantly. Yeah. And it, 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 especially through it, through headphones, it just it's just it's heaven. But I really do wish there was outtakes that we could listen to to see how Elvis built the song. Because we but you're not, even... you're, you're, you're only getting uh, vocal repairs and stuff like that. And... Exactly. There's no alternates. There's no alternates actually exist. So we don't even know. Did he do it in one take? Maybe. Yeah, we, we, we don't even know that, and that's that's the problem because the the the, 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 the the take itself doesn't even have a have a, a take number. It's just it's just referred to as the unrepaired undub master. So it also has its matrix number, but it doesn't have a take number. Well, that, so that shouts out to me that that shouts out to me, Leon, that we're lucky we got it in the first place. Well, possibly, um, possibly, <laughs> because you know, it's like it's got no info behind it. Really, yeah, it's it's very it's really weird. And by the way, there's a few songs from that session in the same the same sort of "Mama Like the Roadies," "Don't Cry, Daddy." Well, the originals, the, 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 the vocal repairs have been done, or, but there's no there's no outtakes for it. Do you, fi- do you maybe find, <coughs> I don't know, Leon, um, do you maybe think it was maybe done when Elvis wasn't there as an instrumental? Well, Don't Cry Daddy was. I mean, it was done on the on the 15th of January. The track was done, same with Hair at the Wind. It was, ju- it was just the track that was done. Um, and Mama like the roses. They were all done on the. They were all done in the same day. Yeah. Um, on the fifth, the fifteenth of January. Because um, it's a difficult it's a one that we can. Because we can only review it as a master. We can't even. Re- we can't even delve into the the story behind it. We can only tell you about whoever you know wrote it, has uh, covered it, and Elvis's version of it. We can't really tell you. We can't compare takes. That's a problem on this one. Well, that's exactly. It. And do you know. There's only there's only a few so there's very few, only a few songs from that whole session where it doesn't actually have a take number, and Gentle on the Wings one, and it's always been something that's really irked me because <laughs> it's it really and much like much like Early Morning Rain from Nashville in nineteen seventy one of your pet peeves as well, isn't it? Because it's one yeah, of your favourites, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I'd totally love to that. see her, and I'm leaving the same because yeah, but I'm leaving it's worse because you have that take one, and then you have Elvis see it at the end of it. Uh, this is a tough song, but it's really worth sticking with. And you can see, I was, you can hear, I was yes. committed to that. Yeah. But then, but then, it really wants you to make you want to listen to it right through to that final take <laughs> eleven. Take eleven, but there's nothing in, <laughs> there's nothing in between. And, the, <laughs> and you're going, oh, I wish I can you. So I would love to know who, how. There's a bit. There's a bit song. in the undubbed version where you hear the harmonica, and then it goes straight into the song. It's like they're just, oh, let's go into it. Yeah. Absolutely, and Absolutely. I think if that song didn't have the harmonica, it wouldn't have been. There wouldn't have been nowhere as near as good. No, no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. And but again, it's. I'd, and, it's I, and, I, and I also wish he did more songs like that. Yeah, yeah. But hey ho, and it, it, like, so I said to you about when we did the the stack stuff, Leon, and about race on rock, etc. He would tease you with a kind of flavour. And you think, oh, let's, let's, let's go, oh, oh, give me some more of that. Nah, oh, Elvis, I could wring his neck sometimes when he does that. Because, yeah. but it's versatile. It, he's given you a mix. That's what Elvis was. He was a mixture of everything. So it's, oh. <laughs> it's <laughs> give me some more gentle on my mind stuff. You know, imagine, yeah. a, imagine a full album like that. Oh, wow. But is, is she, je, of course, this might be only just me. It might not apply to anybody else. I can only speak for myself on this. But when you listen, when I listen to "Gentle in My Mind," it makes me want to go back and hear the song created. 
there's maybe some songs you hear, you'll hear the master and you go, right, okay, that's it. I, yeah. I don't really care, I don't know, but, but that song, I really want to hear outtakes of that song. I really so, do. So do I, because it's, because you never know, you might like a Pacific take better. But there again, that sometimes is, it, happens. Is, is, it the, is it is it that negative suggestion? The fact that you can't have it, so you want it more? <laughs> <laughs> and some people, well, you can't get any better than the master. I'm like, yeah, but we're all different. We might prefer a different take. Like, I I prefer some of the take ones better than the master, and yeah. I totally agree. I totally admit that. But, you know, I think FTD done a great job on this one. They did. With the, the repaired vocal and stuff like that, and yeah, and I'm dubbed in, and oh, it, but it suits being both, I think, Leon. Yeah, I, I, I can ask, I, I, I had to, I wanted to put Gentle on my makeup on my channel, right? I wanted to put it on my channel, but I didn't want just to put it up, so I said, What can I build that I can put up there? So I said, Wait a minute, there's about five or six different versions, they're all different mixes. Which I've heard from your from your yeah, channel, yeah. I'll yeah. just yeah, I'll just put all them. I'll put the vocal repair on. I'll put that, and so it, at least that makes it something, and it makes it interesting on that as well. Um, Memphis yeah, record yeah. mix, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> oh dear, oh. But I did put that right across it, so you know. So, and thankfully so. that vinyl I've got of it's heavily warped, so that gives that gives me another reason not to listen to. It. Have you heard the version on? Um, Edge of Reality, which is the Legendary Performer Volume Three. So this is this is the unofficial because you also you the, the first two Legendary Performance uh, mm -hmm. Legend Perform Performer albums, which were RCA ones, and then you had about another five or six volumes that were unofficial. That's so right. Have you, heard the, have you heard the mix on that? Is that one? On your, is that the one on your channel? By any no, I, no, I haven't put that. One, I didn't actually put that one on. No, I've no. not heard it. I've not heard that one. No. Right. Well, if, if you can, anybody can. If anybody can. Um, you can get a hold of that uh, because what that has it has the, the organ the organ more prominent. So uh, I think obviously be the master you'd want to hear, wouldn't it? Oh, it's got to, to, be. to let oh, them it hear. Yes, it has to be. But to the be. joy of links, they could listen to what they like. Yes, absolutely right. <laughs> so, uh, so the song we're going to direct you to is "Gentle on My Mind" and enjoy, folks. Right, folks, uh, the next track we're going to review from these sessions, and it's probably one of the most well-known ones, um, is In the Ghetto, uh, a.k.a. Vicious Circle, if you want to call yeah. it that. But, uh, yeah, In the Ghetto is probably its main title anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I'm not going to lie, it's a song I've grown out of love with for a long time. I think it's because I overplayed it when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And then when I seen it on the lost performances, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's just. But it's a beautiful song, and you know, like re recent years, Leon, the mixing of the song is terrible, especially on the Elvis Number Ones album. Oh, I just knew you were going there. I just knew you were going there. I just knew you were going there with that. <laughs> I'm not looking at any notes or anything. I'm just going from my own head here. Oh, I'm 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 my pet I don't own the album either. I hate it. <laughs> the worst mix I've ever heard was on the Presley, the all-time greatest hits. The one with uh, the red cover? Yes. Yeah, that, the, that, the iconic that, one, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the same kind of mix as um, from Elvis in Memphis. Same type of mix. I don't like the from Elvis in Memphis mix either. I prefer, no, to, you, I prefer to sorry, sorry, the Memphis, I beg you, the Memphis record. I beg your pardon. From Elvis oh, the Memphis, Memphis, Memphis. Yeah, I beg your pardon. Oh God, I'm, yeah. I'm so sorry for yeah. slating an actual good album there. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. And um, um, I'm gonna just give me two seconds, folks. I'm gonna read over uh, Leon's notes here because I like to. I like to basically read them as I'm going live to you because um, I don't want it to sound too rehearsed. Um, but. Um, I'm going to do a bit of contrast to your notes here, Leon, about this song. Yeah, I'm, I'm, while, while you're looking at that, John, I'm just going to mention to people that the reason that I have, we, we, we use these notes before, it's not, it's just so that we're on track and we're talking about the same thing and that we so that yeah, we, stay, of course. we stay on point. It's not that we're, we're actually using them as uh, to read them, it's just uh, to read them and read them out. It's more or less just to, so that we're We've got a guide, and that we know exactly where we're going with 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 it. Misty on point because yeah. we mentioned way back at the start, John. When we when we first tried to do a review on this, we, <laughs> we swayed so badly, didn't we? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. in fact it was quite embarrassing. 
But yeah. that was the first time we ever spoke. Not even we we had exchanged text messages for about two days, and I said to you, Leon, I followed you from afar. Can we basically do something together? We yeah. didn't know how it was going to even pan out. We just phoned yeah. each other, and I just hit that record button, and there you go. But I think it was yeah. the excitement of. Oh, this guy's on the same wavelength as fanship as me. Absolutely. And um, but yeah, and, and we'll only get better at each time, and we're not ever going to be perfect. We're just two Elvis fans, just reviewing stuff that we love. Absolutely. And um, yeah, so the, to the contrast of your notes here, Leon, I read, and I think it was from, I think it was Jerry Schilling's book. Yes. And it's basically saying that Elvis wasn't really happy with that final result of this song because he he didn't like the backing, but it grew on him and he and then he accepted it. He he actually liked it. Do you, and know, do you know anything about that? I've heard I've heard Jerry Schilling say that before about that, but I think the studio version to me has atmosphere like you wouldn't believe. Oh yes. I think, I think where the strings come in on that, and you've got that 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 solo, um, that acoustic guitar. I think <laughs> yeah. that really creates an atmosphere. And take one to that. Or but it's a different it, key, you know. It is. It's I don't really. Like that. Oh. Do you know? Do you know? Do you know? Like that? Mm-mm. Nah. Mm-mm. It's I too just... high. It's because. <clears throat> do you know something? As a singer, right? Yeah. Okay. It's not a fast song, but the phrasing is very difficult. And yeah. it goes from um, uh, and his mama cries. So when you see yeah. when you get to his mama cries, yeah, it's difficult to keep going because it's it's elongated sentence. Yeah, and it's very difficult for a, a a singer to do. And that's where you tip your hat to Elvis as a singer and a vocalist that his breathing control is phenomenal. And with Leon. Myself and you talk about how Elvis, with his breathing techniques, like on Do You Know Who I Am, etc., right? It's like that on this one as well. It's like a little bit of power, and it goes back into that sort of vulnerable state. And it's difficult to match that as as somebody covering an Elvis song. You mentioned Elvis's breathing there, John, and I'm going to deviate for a wee bit. Elv- if you listen to Elvis's songs all the way through his career, Elvis mm. had a, an awful habit of breathing where most co- both vocal coaches would tell you are the wrong places. He would breathe mid sentence. He would breathe, and, you, and it's a habit that he never broke through no, his and whole you, career. Fi- do you know where the where you, do you know where you'll find that on the, where it's really prominent? And we discussed yeah. this uh, mm-hmm. during the breaks here of the songs. Was inherit the wind. Yeah, but he's he like, never put that on stage. <gasps> no, never no, stage. because you maybe why you don't know. Elvis might be sitting down doing these tracks. You just don't <laughs> know because obviously yeah. when you're standing up, your voice is projected. But see, when you're nervous, yeah, your breathing is a lot less. <gasps> it's it's um because I find that you know a little bit of nerves just gives you the, it it gives you a bit more power. But yeah. and it's less vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Um, but as you say, Leon, yeah, because Elvis wasn't classically trained, so mm-hmm. he he maybe got some vocal coaches, maybe from Charlie Hodge, but mm-hmm. not to the state where we're finding breathing. And and you know what? And nobody ever corrected him on it because obviously you had Chips moment, etc. But maybe that mm-hmm. just gives it that sort of feel anyway. It's Elvis and. Yeah. It's you know, not a criticism, it's just an observation. It's an observation, yeah. And you hear that on this as well. But to me, I, people say, oh, sing in the ghetto, John. I'm thinking, no, and like, so easy. I'm like, yes, it's easy. It's an easy song to sing and it's a nice key. But it's a phrasing that's a problem because yeah. you take your grasp of air and you mm-hmm. think, is this going to last me to the end of the sentence or the verse? And you can't. You just it's a very very difficult song it's not difficult as a live version it's faster yeah. but when it's a slower song when people think a slower song must be easier no it's not because you're elongating those words a lot longer yeah so to go with the melody so there you go that's a bit of a technical <laughs> side for you sorry yeah. but yeah. um song that did really well for elvis too and the first hit 69 was it not 
It was, and it's quite surprising considering that it was so out of Elsie's comfort zone, and I think he oh, needed yeah, a lot of controlling to actually record it. And Mike Davis, um, who also who wrote a few other songs for Elvis, um, he pitched it to Elvis, and well, it's um, a massive song, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. It is and originally called, of course, the Vicious Circle, and yeah. um, and do you know? I hear, I watch a lot, of, a lot of the, the, the people reacting to Elvis's version of it, and it really irks me that most of the reactions to that are to the live version from the 13th of August 1970 dinner show, the ladder with the ladder suit on. And I don't, I, I, to, personally, I never really took to any of the live versions of it. Yeah, you know, Leon, and I'm not just saying it just because I'm. I'm agreeing with you, but I totally agree with you on that because yeah, I really don't. I don't like it. It's not got the atmosphere, and it's it feels rushed. It does. It's, it, it, it's it's like you're throwing away a good song, Elvis. What's going on here? Are you not are you not digging it, or because um, to put it into a medley as well, you're like ooh. But I think he's just going from that Mark Davis kind of thing. He's he's yeah, he's, tipping, he's, he's music, tipping his hat to him really, and I think. Yeah. But he's trying to like I'll sing two hits in one go. That's out of the way, but. Uh, yeah, and each song gets full commitment. Not get, not. I'm not disputing that uh, length wise, but it just seems. Uh, I know. It's, well, you're saying rush, John, and length, but yeah, it just feels that the keys in the um, in the ghetto live is in the key of G. Yeah, and in uh, in the studio, it's in the key of A. So it's totally. That's why you're saying yourself, Leon, different atmosphere because it's in different yeah. key. It's in but, different arrangements as well altogether. I also think that <coughs> it's such a serious song, right, that I think that version that we saw in the Lost Performances, um, which was broken up and you only heard in the ghetto itself in, in the 2001 re-edited version of That's The Way It Is, where Elvis kind of spoils the, the seriousness of the song with that kind of looks, thing at the, end, at the end of the song. And he looks distant. He looks like he's glazed over. Yeah, but I think he was tired in that show because of the the twelfth of August midnight the midnight show the night before. I think there was a little bit of a hangover from that, and I still think yes, exactly. I, and, and I think do you know? I, you know, it was crossing my mind since we have done the last one there earlier. I know we're breaking away, but I'm still keeping on the contrast of in the ghetto here. And you said about tiredness, etc. Right? When did Elvis sleep between these shows? And I'm thinking to myself, is it after the midnight show? Or was it earlier morning? I think it would have to be from about six in the morning because if you listen to what most like the sweets would say or the Imperials that he would go yeah, upstairs yeah. And, and, and and wind down by singing gospel songs and that sort of thing. So I think it'd probably be from six in the morning, probably to goodness, most, uh, maybe six and six, five or six at night. Because when were the um, dinner shows? When did they start? Dinner shows were eight o'clock, and then they lasted till what about ten, half nine. Well, I don't think Elvis came on at eight. I think I think Elvis was probably came on at nine. So I think I think the initial show started at eight. I think Elvis came on at nine. So you're probably talking about ten back at ten. So yeah. What was it? So you didn't have that much of a a gap between the dinner show and the midnight show then? No, no, that's only none. There's a couple hours because of, because you know, that's you'd have that's intense, you'd, 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 you'd have, you'd have the pre-show even at midnight. So the you'd have the pre-show at midnight. So Elvis might not come on stage until maybe quarter to one. And of course, if you, if you really want to dig into it, you've used to, remember, you used to, remember quite a lot of time there was 3M shows as well. <laughs> Usually towards around about closing, closing night, you'd maybe have a special 3M show, um, which happened both in Vegas and in Tahoe, so... <laughs> that's, it's, that's something else, isn't it, to behold? It is. It is. You know, when you, like, we, because... Folks, we're going to delve into all this stuff as we review engagements and stuff like that because we, we're going to take you on a very, very long journey. Yes, indeed. And it's going to take possibly years. It's not just a... Th we, me and Leon are just going to just pa throw like a flash in the pan and we'll be gone. We're going to take you on a full-length story of Elvis's legacy. Absolutely. It'll take us long enough. But, you know... We and Leon just didn't learn this overnight. This is a lifelong thing. Absolutely. And uh, just, I keep thinking about. I keep feeling that we're plugging ourselves to you, but we're not. I just want to just. 
if if we could if you could learn a little bit of what we know that's what we're goal is to Absolutely. just to give you a bit a bit but just a bit more of an understanding as Elvis as an artist, yeah. not just and, what you see on the TV and stuff like that. Yeah, and let's be honest, there, there are hundreds of hundreds of other Elvis fans out there who know probably as much as, as much as much if not more than we know. Um, it's just that we are choosing actually to put this um, out there, um, and if anybody can add to it, then fantastic. Exactly. I've never really right met. Uh, Leon, sorry for interrupt. I've never really met anybody hostile in the Elvis community. Maybe the odd troll, but they're not Elvis fans. But no, I agree. With you. But and overall, we're a really nice community, and I've never ever came across anybody. No, I've, I've been yeah, to Memphis right. twice, and uh, you know the people over there are absolutely great, and they treat you with the really good respect. And, and I've been to many Elvis shows with other people, and you know. You, the, the, yeah, we're all different fans, but mm-hmm. I'm I'm more of a laid back fan, and a bit, I think I'm a bit like you, Leon, in a sense where, where I'm studying. I'm no standing up, clapping my hands, and this and that. And people think, John, are you enjoying this? I'm like, yes, but I'm enjoying it in my own way because yeah, I'm observing. And but like, a, we'll go back to contract and the ghetto here. And um, the same here, he done it in the Houston Astrodome as well. There, Leon, I didn't know that either. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he, he, all, all six shows as well. And do you know, it's the problem. The, the pity is that those shows are <coughs> very, any audio we have of those shows are pretty poor quality. Um, the acoustics. I've never, I've never heard any audio from them because I yeah. know I think it's going because I've heard so much horror stories about even from Elvis himself and the inner circle yeah. how bad it the, was, and I don't think I want to hear it. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean. But why go back in '74? I don't get that's think, another complaint. I, we could go back. I think they'd improved. I think they'd improved it. The yeah, PA they, systems and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, I think that, yeah, but but it is what it is. Um, but it's it's just never been a song that I've I've really liked the light. I've never really liked the live version that. that no, I'm much. the same, Leon. And, and, However, you know, I think that's also because it's went from me live and doing all this live stuff. But yeah, yeah I just. However, yeah. but it's it's a good song and it was oh. it was a commercial success. It was very radio friendly. What's um, good about it as well is that the, the I think the the lyrics have never been more relevant um, to the so time. It, oh yeah, yeah. Well, let's be honest. It's what fifty one years still since relevant it was, to this day because the world is still a, a still yeah it's still a scary really. place and you absolutely. know what I mean and, and it could be irrelevant in the 70s the 80s and 90s to present yeah. day it's yeah. the world's still a scary place and it'll still be irrelevant to some people in some countries and um, it's probably still relevant to the place that Mark Davis even wrote about yeah so, Chica- Chicago is I think it's still quite bad that I like that so, so. Yeah. but um, there's plenty of takes to choose from on this one then Leon yeah but I think I think uh, well, you, um, as, I, as I say, there's a first take to the master on my channel where you can listen to it from the first take right through. But I think we, uh, plus you also get on that, you also got a couple of live versions on that as well, so you can compare the two. But I, I really think that if you if you're going to listen to anything, anything like you, you need to listen to the master because oh, you get, most because, definitely, yeah. Because what I like about the master as well is you've got that string bit bit where it kind of drops. Yeah. People sort of do do like that, and, you get, and, you, and you've got that. You've got that. That it, it's almost like it's an atmosphere, and it's kind of it's kind of letting you know that what you should be thinking about there. Can I just jump in there a little second there, Leon? I I want the listeners to go to a Pacific version of the song, not a Pacific. Uh, it's it's more of a uh, yeah version. I'll we'll go with version. Um, yeah. Try and go to the sixties masters version, because I think that's the most truest sound. Do you think, Leon? What do you think to that? Or your, yeah, or your, or your channel? Uh, I'm a big fan of what Vic Anacini done with the masters when he remastered them. Um, I think. Where are they the, on? Where are they on, Leon? Well, that's that that that's on the the complete the complete Elvis masters, the, but that massive big five hundred pound <laughs> box set. The, the, it's not five hundred pound now. It's over a bloody grand. I seen it the other day. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, because yeah. that's because that's probably because it's the same sound as the sixties masters. It's the same. It's, it's exactly the same. I don't think you could actually get any 
It's fact, you can't tell any difference, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's just, it's just. I think it's just a, a little bit, cr- just a tiny bit crisper. Um, uh, and essentially, Vic Anacena, who who in the who was um, RCA's head engineer in New York, he took every single one of LC's masters and re- remastered them all. Uh, only the ma- only the masters, and that's that that's tends to be my go-to. For most of them, because I think you know something. Like, that's why I job. use my Elvis radio show. Um, I tend to go to that box set. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, do you know what? It's such a good box set. To it's, it's all in chronicle order as well. So, yes. like my friend's partner, he's he likes Elvis, but um, I sent them over to him with that actual copy, and he likes it because when I introduce a song on my show I introduce the year so he's like oh that must be on CD 28 because it's 1971 it's helping the, the new listeners find the song that they like and if they know the year it narrows it down to you know the Pacific CD or the year that they have to go well, to abs- well absolutely right <laughs> absolutely it's it's just what but you see the problem is like like, like an awful lot of things <laughs> it's kind of out of most most people's the reach of most people that that's the problem with a with a set like that. Um, and by the way, even in the likes of us to to purchase it, it's because they don't go out in circulation very long. Yeah. Um, especially box sets because box sets just seem to just die out very very quickly in the Elvis yeah. world as well. And and it, I think it's more of a money thing. See how much money they can get within a short space of time. Yeah. And. Us Elvis fans sometimes suffer, but there's a lot of Elvis stuff I thought I would maybe get. I'll buy it in a couple of more months. Pfft, no, you'll never get it again. And that, and that happened with me with the That's the Way It Is box set, you know, the 8 CD one. Yeah. And that's how many years now? Six, six, seven years now, I'm thinking, I should have got it when I did. And that's yeah. my lesson learned because of the fact that I was going to wait for the Elvis, well, from Elvis in Nashville, but still a lot of circulation. And I think it's, it's weird, uh, Leon, that one, isn't it? Because it's. It's it's mass produced. Yes, but for those who care about such things, um, in the ghetto, in the in the ghetto is uh, track twelve on disc seventeen of the bit of that of that the complete Elvis Presley masters. I thought I heard clicking going on in the back. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. That was me digging into my hard drive there. To... <laughs> digging, he was digging deep, ladies and gentlemen. He was digging yes. deep. He was like a miner. Into, my and, and, into the Elvis mine he was. Yeah, absolutely right. So, yep, we're going to send you on to uh, the link for the master of In the Ghetto, folks. And obviously, most of you know it, but, you know, like Leon's, uh, you know, recommendation, it's a lot more crisper, so enjoy. Okay, then, folks, on to the last song uh, for this part. And uh, we've saved the best of last, obviously. And uh, one of Elvis's biggest hits, and it's uh, Suspicious Minds. Yeah. Well, I describe this, John, and I always say, whatever you are in the world, <laughs> whatever gener- generation you belong to, almost everyone's familiar with Suspicious Minds, and they know exactly who sang it. And you know what, John, the, the best is, despite it being over 50 years old, I still think it sounds as fresh and vibrant as it did when it was come out in August. Oh, yeah. Oh, most definitely. And and it's that <laughs> fake ending that I love. It comes back and that makes the song. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. De- definitely. But the, the, what's they call, they call the Felt, Felton, <laughs> the Felton, the Felton Jarvis fade. <laughs> 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 and some t- and some compilations that's not on it. Yes, it's, it is. It, the, the, well, that one that, we met, that I mentioned we were talking about in the ghetto that the the Presley all time great sets. It's not on that. And you'll find it on radio as well. They don't do it on radio either. Yeah. It, well, I've heard I have heard it on the radio. I have heard it on the. I've heard I've heard it, um, on the radio being played. Um, the 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 faded one been played been played. Um, the Memphis record doesn't have the fade. No. Nope. Um, but that one also doesn't have the strings either on it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of the Viva Elvis version? Oh, jeez, don't. <laughs> oh, don't. <It's> very. <laughs> <laughs> RPO version. <laughs> RPO version. 
Are you are joking. You seriously ask you no, no, no. I, I just feel my leg. The veins about to pop again. Yes, I'm just feeling my leg getting pulled here. <laughs> Sorry. I, I thought you liked me, John. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, you really have to ask that question. I mean, See, I did have the single version of this song, and I gave it to my friend, right? Yeah. And um, I quite like the mix of that. It's good. And it's what Elvis would have heard as well, you know. And you, uh, no, I really liked it. But you know, the I think the irony is that the version that you hear on the all time greatest hits, Presley, and on the Memphis record is probably how it was supposed to sound originally. So that there is the theory that because that the extra overdub session that Felton Jarvis did only did to that after hearing the Vegas arrangement of the song. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yes. So it is possible. Um, so, was there two pressings then of this song? No, the, the single, the single version itself didn't. Ha- I don't think the single version itself didn't have the. I don't think single version itself had the brass in it and had the. The. The the the, the fade in it. I think that happened afterwards. Oh, I'd have to get my friend to actually play right, the well, song because. Well, well, let me, I... right, okay, well, let me put it this way: the violins and the cellos were recorded in the seventh of May, yeah. right? But the br- the brass, that is the trumpets, trombones, and a bass trombone, they were added on the seventh of August, which makes the song. Yeah, and remember, the song came out during uh, the first the first week of Elvis's engagement, or first because he he says that. Yep. Oh, so the second week. The second so there week. Yeah. There wouldn't be enough time to get that recorded and out within a week. Within a week. No, definitely, and especially overseas. So the so the, I'm hoping that that answers your question with that. <laughs> I know what I'm doing when I come off for this podcast. I'm like, uh, <laughs> could you uh, please play, play with that single? Yeah. Um, because it depends what press. Because there must be two presses of it, Leon. There had to be. Yeah. Quite possibly. Because. See, I now wish I'd listened to it more when I had it, when I when I, when I owned it, because I would have yeah. probably noticed the difference. Because the no, B side, the B side sure that was uh, "You'll Think of Me" was the B side to that song. Yeah. No, I th- I, th- I think the original single version of it was 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 what was done on the seventh of May, nineteen sixty nine, with no bra- no brass. Yeah, and and with this song, it's one of those very few songs that works both studio and live. Oh, it does, it does, but I think. The la- the live version is best in 1970 at that speed. I think 69 was a bit slow and a bit sloppy because yeah. he, did, he, he didn't know where he was in the song. Not really. Yeah, yeah. and I think it go- probably goes on just a bit too long as well. Yeah, that's, see, there's some songs I I think about that. And I think you could have ended it at maybe three minutes, but so you're going at the six minute mark and you're like, really? But then what? again, but then I get, as you say, maybe like, really on, like, I'm going to interrupt you again. In 1970, you're getting a visual. It works you are. both ways, doesn't it? It does. But it doesn't feel like six minutes. No, because one of the best six minutes of your life, Mark. <laughs> Absolutely. However, I would advise anybody to, again, and I keep saying it, to go and listen to Elvis building this song because Elvis really was struggling with the song. Because Especially the I, first few takes, he couldn't get it oh, right at all. Oh, well, it's you know, Chip's moments helped him a lot with this and it, and the way I've written it is it's proof positive that talent alone does not a wonderful singer make, right? Because and I, I, it needs patience, dedication, Perseverance and something that we mentioned right at the start, discipline and a good degree of professionalism. Because in that second verse, Elvis is really, really struggling with the yeah. phrasing. Yeah, the, the, um, can, the, old, the, old, can, the old friend I know part. Yes, yeah, and he's yeah, yeah. really, 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 you can really hear the frustration. I mean, it's not veiled, it's obvious. And there was some, there was some quote I seen, oh, Elvis done it in two takes. Did he, hell? <laughs> Sorry, what? <laughs> No, <laughs> no, I think not. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not mentioning anyone's names on this because it's from a YouTube channel. But I no. think you'll find. I think you'll find it was 
eight takes. Yes, his eight takes, exactly. And he was pushing it then, Leon. Yes. And even then, only three, only, the, only six, seven and eight were complete takes. And pardon the pun, it was a never, never attempt. It was, but have you heard? Have you heard just before he sings that he wanted to call the master? I'm saving the last take for me. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing it for himself, not not Chip's moment. Yes, exactly. This, but again, but no, but again, this goes back to what we were talking about at the start because just before that, Chip's moment says, "I think we can do this one more time." That's right, and, and, that's, and that, that's the greatness about. First take to a master. It's a story, isn't it? Yeah, but do you know this? This oh, a is a great track lead, as well. It is, but this is going to lead in perfectly here. Now I mentioned there about Chip's moment saying Elvis, you can get one more, and Chip, I think Chip's moment knew what they had. Um, it has become, and hindsight has proved that it, became, it has become a timeless classic. But it almost never happened. Almost didn't happen, and do you want to explain that? Yeah, well, this all of all of those eight takes and all of that perseverance from Elvis was uh, was almost in vain because it nearly never saw the right day. And you know what? It was due to internal RCA and Elvis management politics, and that really, I mean, I'm, I can feel myself starting to get frustrated because this was the first and only time that Elvis recorded with an independent producer. We mentioned that way back at the start of the bat, and. And, and an independent studio. Now, uh, some people have said to me about radio recorders could be regarded as such, but, but that was often hired by RCA for its artists, whereas American Sun Studios wasn't. That was different. However, so Chip's moment helped. He, he was he was guiding Elvis through all this. And, yeah. And when he said that, he was anything but a yes man. But what's really important is that he also owned the copyright to Suspicious Minds. However, get, who would be unhappy with that? Colonel <sighs> Parker. Right. So oh. then, but then he sends his deputy Tom Diskin, and he demands that that moments gives up half of these rights. So what does Chuck Woman do? Well, he responds and accuses them of stealing. <laughs> the club would never see the light of day. So it what it actually took it took the personal intervention of Elvis and RCA's Harry Jenkins, who you can see being interviewed on. I think he, is he is he not is he not on the that and that's the way it is. And then, yes, the original one, yeah. Yes, and then a compromise was reached, and just for once, artistic endeavour triumphs over monetary gain. But unfortunately, that was never, never going to happen. But then, of course, there was a further twist when it goes into post production. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, know, you know where I'm going with this, John, don't you? You know where I'm yes. going with this. Yes. So, so this is Chip's moment. He turned around the years when he said that the film it was his own producer, Film Jarvis, who's never happy with Elvis recording it making sound. And Chip's moment he called he called it a control thing. So Phil Jarvis takes the tape of suspicious minds and then he adds that fifteen second fade that you mentioned um at the start. Yeah. And Chip's moment says he's no idea why he did it. But in Chip's moment's um personal opinion, he messed it up and it was like a scar. Um so he, what Chip's Moman seems to think is that that's Felton Jarvis essentially saying to Chip's Moman, well, um, he might own the public to the song, but but I'm going to put my own stamp on it. Yeah. But do you know what? Does it matter? Because it was back at the top of the charts, and that's all that mattered, wasn't it? Exactly. And you know what? And it became a staple of his live performances as well. So it, yes. it, it, it helped Elvis give us some of the best performances of his life. And yes. You know, and but you know, my my dad never tires of hearing that song. Actually, he really loves the song, um, yeah. and yeah. it's funny. Like, if you go into a pub and somebody sticks on the jukebox, nine times out of ten they're chucking on Suspicious Minds. I've noticed, and yes. it's funny. Well, we're mentioning that Presley album, right? The the compilation. Yeah. I found that a lot in the jukeboxes back in the day. <laughs> I think yeah. every pub had it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think you're right, actually. And um, and me as an Elvis song going, where's the, where's the fade? Where's, where's the Felton Jarvis fade? <laughs> yeah, I know. And you know what? It's, do you know what, though? It, it's that thing that makes a song too, though. And I get, I know he wasn't the greatest producer in the world, and I get that. He's got yeah. his flaw, flaws, yeah. but... What he tried to do to ruin it made it good, <laughs> so he didn't realise he was actually doing a good thing rather than a bad thing. Do you know? 
I, I, there's something else I think we've got to mention as well because you mentioned all the other uh, uh, um, instrumentation on that song on the song, and we're talking here specifically, especially about about the the, the full length version with the fade and that in it. And I think we've also got to point out that Elvis, first of all, he recorded his own harmony vocal on that as well. Um, that was after the eighth take. But you've also got, I've also really got to, to, to mention Jeannie Green, Donna Thatcher, and the Holiday Sisters, Mary and Ginger. Because. They make this yeah, song, Leona. And they I, do. Yeah, they it's, do. Everybody knows about, about their. Because if anybody's singing along to Suspicious, woo, 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 that bit, yeah, they yeah. know, yeah, yeah, they know, they know that bit, and they know their bit, and I really think it because, and do you know what's really strange is that I think that the Sweets managed to replicate that when they did in the in the live version. Yeah, get, yeah, give them their due. They, they 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 did their best with that, and to to compare to their attempt at in the ghetto. Um, but yeah, they did really well, and obviously there was male vocals as well mm-hmm. towards when the seventies start to 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 take take effect. And mm-hmm. um, but you know, as the seventies wore on with the suspicious minds, it became a bit more a, a parody to itself. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, but the song we should play and end up with, because whoever's following us in the fall of every week, they've heard. The, the suspicious minds from the twelfth of August. Yes, which was bloody fantastic, anyway. But mm-hmm. now we're going to go to what would you say the master again, Leon? For oh, this it's one, got, yeah, it's got to be. Yeah, With the felt and Jarvis the fader. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, just to sum it this up this afternoon, it's been a great, great podcast. Um, more to come, folks, in part two. Yes, but um, I think we've covered the greats on this one. And yes. we'll delve into, you know, you know, other parts of the session when, when we come back for our part two on this. Yeah, just just, just to give them a wee t- a wee a wee taste of John. There's some absolute crackers um, in the next bit. There, there's one um, where we'll, we'll tell about a story where Elvis was returning a favour to Neil Diamond. There's one one where there's an absolute magnificent vocal um, by Can Elvis. I, but in there, just one more second of later. Course. I, I, the guy I've mentioned, my colleague Paul, a few times in, in the shows, and um, he's a massive Neil Diamond fan. And I'm not going to give it away because it's obviously a part of the next show. But I told him this fact that we're going to say, and he was blown away. He didn't know. Yeah, he didn't know. And obviously, that's the one that you're going to obviously talk about, Leon. Well, yeah, you're going to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. But that's going to be in part two. So, yes. um, you know, hopefully, we've left you wanting more and. Uh, well, we'll see. and this is this is obviously going to go on to the radio show. It's going to go on to the YouTube channel. It's going to go on to the Facebook page. So, if you miss out on the show on Sunday on my radio show, you'll be able to find it on on our uh, channel at any time at your own behest. But that'll be it within the new year, which is only next week when you think about it. It's only a week and a bit away, so it's not that long to wait for everything to just come together, and you can listen to it as much as you like then. So. Yeah, it's been great. I think it's been awesome. Has been, yeah, it has been. This has been really, really good. I'm really looking forward to part two because there's a couple of really my real favourites in part two as well. So I'm really looking forward to that. Well, myself and Leon are going to leave you with the master of Suspicious Minds and we'll both see you again. <laughs>